I have a love-hate relationship with Demon Souls. It's the beginning of the Souls series and the beginning of one of the most influential genres in modern gaming. It has intricate levels with winding paths, shortcuts and tough enemies that will kill you in a few hits. But it's different from the rest of the Souls games. It's a more contained experience, it leans more heavily into its RPG roots and it's filled with gimmicks that you either love or hate. And it seems everyone from Sony, the owners of the IP, to critics and your average gamers are all in the same boat. Sony clearly didn't care about Demon Souls because they weren't even bothered publishing the game in the West. Colin Moriarty and Greg Miller always tell the story about how IGN didn't care about it either. The game was sent to them at IGN and they assigned it to some freelancer and it ended up receiving a 9.4 out of 10. It was a game that many people loved when it was released, but it never received the recognition it deserved. So let's flash back to 2011, two years after Demon's Souls was released. I was a young PC gamer hipster that loved to watch Total Biscuit, one of my favourite YouTubers of all time. He was a massive advocate for Dark Souls coming to PC, and eventually, from listened to his giant community outcry, and they delivered. A shoddy PC port that he then had to apologise for, which is one of the weirdest situations I've ever seen in early YouTube gaming. Anyway, this spawned my love for the series. I bought the game when it got ported to PC, realised I couldn't really use mouse and keyboard, went over to GameStop with what little money I had, and bought a GameStop own brand Xbox 360 controller, and I started playing it. I put 60 hours into Dark Souls 1 Prepared to Die Edition, and I barely made it halfway through the game, and then I gave up, because it was just too hard. But three years later, Dark Souls 2 was released just before my birthday, so 15, nearly 16 year old me was ready for another challenge, and another challenge I got. I bashed my head against a wall trying to beat it, trying multiple builds, fighting all the early game bosses, but the Brightstone Cove was where I gave up. And I could see that this series was something special, but I just couldn't get through it. And to cut a long story short, one year later, Scholar of the First Sin was released, and that was the game that did it. I put 180 hours into it on PS4 and loved every second of it. The intricate level design, the build crafting, the never ending journey going from area to area, it finally clicked with me and from there I never looked back beating every Souls game ever released. That was until I got my hand on a US copy of Demon Souls in 2017. I had just beaten Dark Souls 3 and Bloodborne only a year before this so I was excited to finally go back to the roots of this series and see what it was all about. And while I adored Boletaria, every subsequent area led to more and more frustration. Giant bugs in a cave blocking my way that took 900 hits to kill, long runs through levels with no shortcuts all while getting shot at by giant manta rays, poisonous swamps that I don't even need to explain, and then these tentacle feckers that have to be one of the most annoying enemies in the whole series. Safe to say I gave up on the game and it was for three reasons. I found it more frustrating than the other Souls games, and then the flame lurker was very tough and he was kicking my ass. And then finally, the game just didn't run very well on the PS3 and that's something that's consistent with pretty much every single FromSoft game. So I gave up back then and I never looked back. But of course, in 2020, Bluepoint Games remade Demon's Souls for the PS5 and oh my god, it looked amazing. It's still one of the best looking games on the console. And while I got further, I was actually almost finished the game. I was sucked into playing too many games to get reviews out, so I eventually put the game down after being close enough to beating it. My Elden Ring video was about righting the wrongs of the review cycle and enjoying games to their full extent, and this is no different. I finally beat Demon's Souls for the first time, and what I found in some aspects was more frustrating than I remembered and in other aspects less frustrating, but a playthrough of Dark Souls after Demon's Souls changed my opinion slightly. Going into this playthrough, I was a bit apprehensive because for every boss or area I remembered fondly, there were more areas of bosses that I was dreading because of some reason or another. 
Boletari is a fantastic level, but the latter half of Stonefang is crap. I enjoyed the second part of Latria, but I hated the prison section. The first part of the Shrine of Storms is great, but then the area after the Adjudicator is awful. So to say that I wasn't excited about having to go back through the game would be a bit of an understatement. And for this video, I beat the game twice. Once as a mage, and once as a paladin style character so I could get a feel for both playstyles. And honestly, I'm glad I did two playthroughs because if I had wrote this script after playing through the game for the first time, this would have ended a lot different. Boletari is the first level and it started a trend of FromSoft games having amazing opening levels. It's a quainter version of the Undead Burg, a castle structure that is simply fun to explore. It really introduces you to the soul style where enemies can hide behind things, barrels would be laid out in areas where enemies fling bombs at you, it shows off the brilliant shortcuts that the series is known for, having two major ones in the first section, and then one of the most infamous aspects of the Soul series, dragons. Specifically ones that ambush you on a bridge and act as a decent way to farm items and souls, and of course, a cheap way to get your killed. And it's in this first section where you're introduced to Ostrava, and this is one thing I love about Demon Souls. It'll be your first introduction to the contentious FromSoft quest lines, you know the ones where you need a guide to follow them. I wish they kept the Demon Souls style where the NPCs move around in the world. You meet him by jumping down a ledge, killing some of the undead, and then he walks through the level and you can choose to help him, and I much prefer actually seeing the NPCs rather than just talking to them, summoning them for a fight, and then meeting them in another random location later on in the game. And it's probably why I got so invested in his story. He's the son of the king who was turned mad, and I personally love the open-ended approach where everything isn't told to the player. Because it means you can sit down and discuss it with your friends or you can read theories online. And I was talking to my friend about the ending and I kind of interpret his ending as him succumbing to the madness that his dad did too. And that's why he attacks you in the end. And it's just a tragic story but it's one that I got invested in way more than the majority of other quest lines in the whole series going forward. Boletari is up there with the greats of the Soul series and I genuinely love every single section of it. Unfortunately though, the game slowly goes downhill from there. And I think that's a criticism that can be leveled at most of these games. The opening sections are so strong that the rest, while still good, pale in comparison. But from my memory of playing through the games, Demon's Souls is the biggest culprit it is. Stonefang is a beautiful area. I love the first section where you can look out on the horizon. And then from a gameplay perspective, it's a strong opening for one reason. And before I finish this point, let me know if you think it does actually do this successfully. I think Stonefang attempts to teach the player how different damage types work. The minor enemies in the level are extremely weak to piercing damage, and if you hit them with anything other than that, they'll just tank hits till the cows come home. And later on in the level, you find a pickaxe, which is an absolute godsend for these enemies. And I can't tell if I understand this because maybe I read it somewhere without even knowing, or my friend told me. Or maybe I just have experience with the series so I could kind of put two and two together. So if Demon Souls was your first game, could you actually figure this out by yourself? I mean, it's that unique element of Demon Souls is the fact that it's actually an RPG where damage type and resistance truly matter. You could smack these guys around with a mace all day and it can be frustrating. And I think it forces you into learning what enemies are weak to different things. And I know enemies still have weaknesses in Dark Souls 1, 2 and 3 and Elden Ring, but it certainly becomes less important as the series go on. Now you're probably asking do I actually like the RPG stuff because in my Elden Ring video I talk about how I love how open-ended it is and I do think it's a different story. I like the fact that I can make any build in the later games and they could be viable in pretty much every single boss fight bar a few but Demon Souls is just different. It's more of an RPG so it doesn't bother me as much as it would in the later more action-y games. Unfortunately though it's not all sunshine and roses in the Stormfang tunnels. Because once you get into the actual tunnels, the level turns to absolute shit. It has windy paths that feel aimless, a lava section that feels useless, and then you run into the giant bugs that block your way and take 400 hits to kill, and it just kills the pacing of this whole level. And yes, I know you can kite them to run around them, but they're still annoying nonetheless. The Flame Lurker is the boss that stopped me on my PS3 playthrough, and here with Magic and the Moonlight Greatsword, he wasn't too big of an issue, but I do enjoy this fight quite a bit because he's tough but fair. His attacks are very readable and he feels like a primitive version of the big boss fights in the rest of the series, but because he's so readable, it doesn't feel overwhelming. But speaking of readability, the next boss is the Dragon God, and this is the first gimmick fight that you will run into in the game. 
and I want to highlight the word gimmick because he's the worst gimmick fight in the whole game. If you haven't fought him, you have to hide behind these pillars, clear the path in front of you, shoot him with two ballistas, and then hit him a couple of times in the face. It's relatively easy, but I hate how unreadable he is. Even though I've beaten him three or four times now, I still am none the wiser on when to move because it's hard to see where he's looking and it's definitely the most annoying of all the gimmick fights in the game. Latry is where I changed my mind the most from my first playthrough to this final playthrough. When I started up Demon Cells again, I was reminded of all the annoying crap in the game. The rays that shoot you halfway across the map, the swamp in the valley of defilement, and these guys, yeah, these tentacle feckers that are up there with the most annoying enemies in the whole franchise. And they're tough. If they electrocute you, you can kiss your life goodbye, because they'll sprint headfirst towards you and zap your health bar. And I was expected to be frustrated by this area like I was my first go around, falling down the bottomless pits, getting zapped by the tentacle lads, but instead, I found an atmospheric area that sucked me in straight away. I think the remake helps this level a lot because of how hauntingly beautiful it is. I think you'd struggle to find a more atmospheric area in a game full stop. Latria kind of feels more like a Bloodborne level and I like the change in tone from level to level. Now this is home to one of the most infamous boss fights in the whole series and that is the Maneaters. They're infamous for a couple of reasons. There are two of them and that's always fun. But also their attacks can knock you back, and more often than not, that knockback will send you flying off the boss arena. But I played this directly after Elden Ring, so everything just felt simple. Yeah, they can be tough, but just like the Flame Lurker, they have a small moveset that is pretty easy to dodge. And on a side note, having bosses that float in the air and you can't attack them is bad. And yes, that is aimed at the final boss of Shadow of the Air Tree, which I won't mention his name or show any footage of. The last fight here is something very unique. You battle an invader, or in most cases an NPC, and it's just such a novel idea that sticks with you. And that goes for all of the end fights in these levels. I'm sure I fought hundreds of bosses in the whole Soulsborne, Kiro, Core Ring series, whatever you want to call it. And a lot of them are memorable, but these fights definitely stick out more than most, and it's one of the best aspects of Demon Souls. Now, Latria was an area that I actually did a full 180 on. I didn't like it before I played it, and now I like it more than I did before. And Shrine of Storms is the complete opposite. This is where my frustration quadrupled. This level forces you to use a shield. Something that I didn't want to use in my playthrough, but as a wise man once said, a baby's gotta do what a baby's gotta do. So I swallowed my pride and hid behind my shield just to deflect the first attack of the rolling skeletons, and then I had no problems. Now I will give it credit, the first section is top notch. It feels like there are endless ways to go with secrets around every corner, and I even found Sparkly the Crow, which I hadn't done in my previous playthrough. But once you beat the Adjudicator, the level falls straight off a cliff, which is ironic because you'll probably be doing that a lot in this level. Narrow walkways with sharpshooter manta rays, bow wielding skeletons, and even more skeletons rolling at you will never be fun, ever. And then you get into the catacombs, which I honestly hate. It has such a long runway with enemies that can nearly one-shot you. And the thing I dislike the most is the fact that it forces you to go on a mad sprint to kill the summoners. I usually prefer fast, crackhead games, and while it took me some time to get used to the slower pace of Demon Souls, eventually I started to enjoy taking my time and soaking in the atmosphere, which is probably why I enjoyed Latria so much. But I couldn't do the same in the Shrine of Storms, because you just have to sprint through straight to the summoner enemies. Now it is saved a fair bit by the bosses, because I think this has the strongest collection of bosses of any of the levels. First you have the Adjudicator, who's this big boy that you can deal almost zero damage to, until you notice the sword in his stomach, smack it a few times and he'll drop, and this just feels different to the later games. And then you have the old hero who is my favourite fight in the game, and one of my favourite fights in the series full stop. The first time I fought him back in 2020, I struggled. He has some crazy wild slashes that can deal a lot of damage, and trying to fight him head on is a challenge. But then my friend told me that he's actually blind, and if you walk slowly or equip a certain ring, you can stealthily kill him, which is such a clever implementation of a gimmick. It reminds me almost of like a Kojima boss fight, which I guess is quite a compliment. And I'll go back to it because for every Pont of Sullivan in Dark Souls 3 that had destroyed me, or some big spectacle fight in Elden Ring, or even the one-on-one -on -one fights like Gwyn from Dark Souls 1. They're all good fights, 
but the old hero will stick with me way longer than any of them. Even the Storm King, while easy and a bit obtuse on your first go around, is a great spectacle. If the Shrine of Storms didn't have these boss fights, then I would say I hate it, but they do go a long way in leaving a good taste in my mouth after being destroyed by a lot of skeletons and manta rays and falling off cliffs. The Valley of Defilement is probably where I'll go against the grain the most, because it's actually one of my favourite areas in the game. Well, the first section anyway. Rickety villages and swamps are a staple of this series, and eventually they become annoying, but I love the tension of exploring them. It's that tension that makes the Soul series so popular. Creeping around every corner, knowing that there'll be something above, behind, below you at any moment is unmatched. And it makes up what I love about these games. And the opening level creeping around the village just captures that so perfectly. But then you get into the swamp, and just like your descent into the swamp, the level goes downhill fast. The swamp section and the boss is Bar the Maiden of Astraea, which is just a somber fight that will stick with me. It's probably the weakest part of the game overall. Whoever thought fighting multiple enemies in a swamp that disables your roll and inflicts poison on you is a good idea should be fired. And if that is Miyazaki, then so be it. I know later on they still lean into this, but if you go to Blight Town, you actually don't really spend that much time in the swamp part of it. Whereas here, it feels like the majority of the level is in the swamp. And it's just so annoying. This is where I was introduced to World Tendency. And I knew about it, but only through watching videos and talking to my friend who loves Demon Souls. But how in God's name is anybody supposed to understand what is going on with this? The reason why I cared about World Tendency this go around is because I wanted two weapons. Both of which spawn in pure white World Tendency in the Valley of Defilement. So after killing a boss, rolling off the Nexus and then killing another boss, I could find the two weapons which came in very handy for my build. In concept, having a system that changes the world, as in what areas you can explore, what enemies spawn, or what items you can get, is interesting. And I think this could be brilliant, but it's implemented so clunkily both from how you interact with it and how it's taught to the player that I feel like it's just wasted potential. To get a world of pure white tendency, you have to kill every boss while also not dying in human form. Again, something I only found out through Google. So what this means is that when you kill a boss and become human, all the guides recommend you go back to the Nexus, roll off the top, and then return to solid form so you don't affect the world's tendency. And that's just why it feels clunky. And while there are ways to change world tendency without using multiplayer, it just becomes kind of frustrating. And my friend was going for the platinum, and he had to get worlds to pure white and pure black tendency. And it was just an annoying clunky system of summons and killing people and getting invaded and killing them and then going into other people's worlds and killing them and it's it's just not implemented very well but i would like to see what would have happened if they implemented this in demon souls 2 if they refined it because i think as a system it's very interesting <laughs> Obviously I have been kind of mixed in this video, there are certain elements of Demon's Souls that I really like and other elements that I really hate. So it's kind of a mixed bag, overall it's still a great game. And with all that being said, this video was going to be a lot more negative initially. I found that I liked areas I previously disliked and disliked areas that I previously liked, which is why these more contextual videos are better. I was holding off on writing this script because I was figuring out what angle to take it. And while I did that I played through one and a half playthroughs of Dark Souls 1. Half of a playthrough through the Prepare to Die edition on my Steam Deck, and the other full one on the PS4. And the second half of Dark Souls 1 made me rethink my whole approach to Demon Souls. In my head, I was comparing the levels of Demon Souls to my idyllic memories of Dark Souls 1. And by that I mean the first half or so of Dark Souls is genuinely fantastic. And don't get me wrong, I still love the game, it's one of the best games ever created. But the Tomb of the Giants, Demon Runes, Lost Islet, and the Crystal Caves made me realise that even the poster child that is Dark Souls 1 has some awful areas and bosses. I'm looking at you, Beds of Chaos. Demon Souls is just as much of a mixed bag as Dark Souls, so I was too harsh on it at first. For every Boletaria, for every old hero boss fight, there is an area like the Shrine of Storms that is more frustrating than anything, or Stonefang, which is just a slog. And it's the same in Dark Souls 1. The Undead Burg, Blight Town, and the first half-ish of the game are so strong, but the ending feels rushed and unfinished. And I guess that's one of the biggest problems with Demon's Souls and Dark Souls 1 is that 
they do seem like they had to be rushed near the end. Demon Souls obviously has the Arch Stone that you can't do anything with. And then areas like the Demon Runes in Dark Souls 1 genuinely look like they just copy and pasted enemies. Demon's Souls is a different experience from the later games in the series. The build diversity is significantly smaller than the others so it feels tighter. You essentially only have a handful of actual different builds you can do. It still has interesting weapons like the large sword of moonlight, but there are no real offensive faith miracles like in the later games. But that necessarily isn't a bad thing, it's just different. Do I prefer having unlimited builds and more open approach to fighting enemies and bosses? Yeah, of course I do. But it's almost a look into what could have been. I love what the Soul series became over the years. Each game got bigger and bigger with more bosses, more areas and more builds and it all culminated in the behemoth that is Elden Ring. But I wonder what would have happened if they honed in on Demon Souls and stuck to their tighter style of game to see where they could have taken it. I also would have loved to see how gimmicky the gimmick fights could be. Am I glad I finally beat it? I definitely am. It's a good lesson in what could have been for the series and it's still a good game but I don't think I'll be in any rush to play it again.